Imagination sparks curiosity that can change the world. At Johnson & Johnson, we understood early on that women are the catalyst for creating healthier people, healthier communities, and a healthier world. We have seen heroic women realizing big dreams, making breakthrough contributions to science, technology, engineering, math, manufacturing, and design. Today, we see the greatest opportunities to change the trajectory of human health coming from these fields. That is why we are committed to empower women and girls at pivotal moments in their lives, to fuel their passion for progress, and to realize their dreams. Welcome to Johnson & Johnson Women in STEM 2D. Beginning in early education, we encourage curiosity and spark enchantment within young girls to explore STEM 2D through creative problem solving, learning, and play. At the university level, we are working with prestigious academic institutions to inspire undergraduate and graduate students to explore and pursue education, complete their STEM 2D degrees, and pursue a career in these fields. At the professional level, we champion and celebrate the power of women in STEM 2D roles by reimagining recruitment, development, and retention of women in STEM 2D careers. Our community empowers women to stay vital and visible throughout their career journeys. Because at Johnson & Johnson, we know that to truly serve the diverse needs of our patients, consumers, and customers, our workforce should reflect that diversity. To expand and accelerate our mission, we are building strategic partnerships with leaders in STEM 2D fields. Our Why STEM 2D initiative provides incredible opportunities and memorable experiences for millions of girls, young women, and professionals around the world. Together, we can imagine the next generation of inventors and creators realizing one dream at a time. Hello, I'd like to welcome you to the virtual Regeneron ISEF 2021 panel on women and STEM. It's going to be a fantastic conversation and I'm so glad to join you here. My name is Nancy Shute. I'm the editor in chief of Science News Magazine, which is published by the Society for Science, the sponsor for this amazing competition. And I'm going to be here with four amazing scientists who I would like to introduce to you now. They are Dapo Ajayi, Vice President for Technical Operations and Supply Chain Strategy at Johnson & Johnson. She lives in Switzerland. Our next speaker will be Dr. Heidi Williams, who's a Charles R. Schwab Professor of Economics at Stanford University. She won a MacArthur Fellow Prize in 2015 and she's also an alumna of this competition. She competed in 1999. Our next speaker is Dr. Dawn Wright. Um, she is the chief scientist at ESRI, which is the Environmental Systems Research Institute. And she's also a courtesy full professor at Oregon State University. And our fourth speaker is Dr. Huda Zogby. She's a professor at Baylor College of Medicine and a winner of the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences in 2017. So our format for this panel is that we have questions coming to you, wonderful scientists from finalists in the competition from all over the world. Um, I will introduce them and their question, and then you'll, I will call on each one of you taking turns answering questions, and you'll have an opportunity to answer. Uh, and I might throw in a couple questions of my own just to satisfy my own curiosity. Um, and um, we'll proceed like that. So I'm actually going to ask the first question as moderator. Uh, and I'm going to ask Dr. Williams, uh, you were a math major in college and a lot of our finalists are really interested in math. Can you tell us how studying math in college led to you becoming an economist? Um, 
So I grew up in rural North Dakota and um, I had a lot of wonderful teachers, but I went to a, a sort of school that was not especially well resourced in terms of getting into sort of lab sciences or other sciences. And so for me, kind of developing an interest in mathematics was sort of a very natural path because it's something you can do, you know, even if your school is not offering kind of a lot of high tech access to materials. And so um, that was actually the basis for my ISEP project was some projects in mathematics. Um, I did some computer science and got really interested in cryptography and number theory and then went to college thinking that was sort of what I wanted to pursue and I think like a lot of students that I see uh, teaching now in a university setting I think um, I got caught up in something that is uh, not uncommon which is people try to encourage you when you show promise in a technical area and they sort of try to instill confidence in you that you can go ahead and do sort of very technically challenging material. And so I had a lot of people tell me, oh, you're you're doing a great job. You know, you should think about getting a PhD in mathematics because you can. And so I was very uh, encouraged by that. And I had a lot of female mentors that really encouraged me. And I was having a great time in college doing mathematics. Um, it turns out loving a subject doesn't necessarily mean that you should go get a PhD in it. And, you know, you kind of want to think about what would I actually be happy doing for my job and my career, apart from just enjoying doing mathematics and a problem solving sense. And so once I started to think about sort of more career aspects later in college, um, I realized that there were a lot of ways that I could use mathematics in different ways in different careers that differed actually pretty substantially in various dimensions. So partly that's the day-to-day -day emphasis of are you teaching or doing research? Are you doing practical problem solving? Um, within research, I think there's a lot of variation in the distance that you are from social problems. So, you know, as an academic mathematics uh, professor, I could be, you know, motivating my work by some, you know, practical problems, but it's more removed than as an economist, I'm sort of interfacing very closely with policy and my day-to-day -day sense and really kind of in engaging on the ground and in, in trying to translate my work into something that has a more direct impact. Um, there's also, you know, a distinction between being in a career where you choose your own problems versus being given problems. For me, I always really liked the freedom of choosing problems. And so academic research was something I was really drawn to. And then there can sometimes be a distinction between working independently versus part of a team. And for me, I really like that economics has been kind of a more team-based collaborative uh, nature. Not that mathematics doesn't have that, but I think it's kind of less of a natural uh, development than, than I find the social sciences. And so for me, in a lot of those dimensions that kind of added up to using math, but applied to social problems in kind of a way that was more directly related to society and solving policy challenges and being an academic economist has been a really rewarding career for me in those dimensions. That's so great. Thank you so much for explaining that for us. Uh, the next question is for Dawn and this comes from Charlotte in California. I was wondering if you had any influential role models. I had many influential role models. Uh, I started off my life in the Hawaiian Islands, and uh, so I fell in love with the ocean, and I would call the ocean uh, a role model because spending my, my days uh, outside of school uh, frolicking in the ocean and exploring on the beaches, uh, I fell in love uh, with the ocean and wanted to become an oceanographer. I uh, spent my Sunday nights uh, watching Jacques Cousteau uh, on, on TV, as well as the wonderful world of Disney, and that's the way a lot of budding oceanographers started. So uh, Jacques Cousteau was a, was a virtual role model. But as I started to actually research how one becomes an oceanographer, I discovered that uh, you really need to focus on one of the basic sciences. So a lot of uh, young people think about marine biology and uh, they are trained first uh, in biology. I was really interested in rocks and sediments and volcanoes. And so I focused on, on geology. And there were a lot of wonderful uh, geologists who were role models uh, for me uh, at the time. And uh, it, it was uh, really, uh, an exploration uh, of love in terms of, of reading about these uh, various scientists. Uh, there are people who are interested in chemistry uh, and physics uh, of the oceans, and so they become chemical and physical oceanographers. And then there are people who are who are engineers, and they actually build vehicles, exploration vehicles. Uh, they build components of, of research ships. 
And so that's another field of oceanography. So to fast forward, I went to school and got trained uh, in geology. And uh, at the time, the only way that you could become an oceanographer was to go on to graduate school. And so uh, I finished with my degree and went to graduate school uh, at Texas A&M University. And it was very interesting because my experience there uh, was varied in terms of, of the, the support that I received as a student. And my role models there were actually fellow graduate students. And they were both, in fact, two of them in particular, uh, male graduate students, uh, Caucasian male graduate students were, were my main mentors. And they were actually uh, responsible for me getting through my program uh, and becoming a uh, practicing uh, oceanographer, which then led me to go to sea for three years and work as a marine laboratory specialist uh, going to sea uh, on research vessels or one research vessel in particular for uh, six months out of the year. And there I encountered uh, more role models among my fellow uh, technicians, um, men and women uh, among them. And you can see the theme here is that we, we can have uh, role models of all uh, different backgrounds. They can be male or female. Uh, and, and so that was very, very a very positive experience for me, especially as we had many adventures uh, sailing uh, throughout Antarctica, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Atlantic Ocean. After three years of that, I uh, went back to school for my PhD and had my first uh, real professional female role model, who was one of the uh, professors at UC Santa Barbara who was helping me with my PhD dissertation, and she was responsible for me getting a, a seat in the deep submersible uh, vehicle Alvin. Uh, and so that was part of my uh, research there at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, so she was a fantastic role model. And then I also found out about other ocean explorers at that time, uh, Sylvia Earle, uh, remains a role model and a friend to me to this very day, as well as Jane Lubchenco, who is also another very famous uh, oceanographer. And then putting all of that aside, the, the most important role model for me uh, has been my mother, who is not a scientist at all. Uh, she was actually, throughout her career, an instructor in speech communication, and she was also very involved in theater arts. And we just have had a wonderful relationship, a friendship, and she has encouraged me and mentored me no matter what I was uh, interested in doing. Uh, she, she held her fire, so to speak, when I was away at sea for two months at a time uh, and tried not to worry too much. Uh, but she uh, remains uh, actually the best role model uh, of all. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. I love how science led you to this life of adventure and exploring the world. And uh, it just sounds, it sounds so exciting. Our next question comes from Neil in New York. And I'm going to ask this one for Huda. How can we make initiatives to close the gender disparity in STEM more inclusive of women of color and women from underrepresented regions? Thank you. Thank you so much for asking this very important question, Neil. We have to start very early. We have to start when children are in grade school and middle school, because if we wait to do it when they're in college, we've lost the interest in the potential community from a large segment of our population. And to your point, because we really learned how um, little sometimes students in underrepresented schools are exposed to science in a way that's accessible and easy and exciting for them. We also learned that many people in underrepresented community, the science teacher don't have the same kind of resources that children who live in communities in other wealthier communities, if we will, they have. Sadly, you know, COVID revealed a lot of things about the disparities, but we hear one thing was not mentioned. I run an institute. I'm the director of a neurological research institute at Texas Children's Hospital here in Houston. A 
in addition to being professor at Baylor. So the community of investigators, all of us came together and asked, what could we do? I'm just giving you an example. And we decided to formally adopt classes in our city in Houston, where each investigator or fellow or advanced graduate student would take on uh, a class and we will connect with the students in those class. We will connect with their teacher. We will ask the teacher what supplies we can bring to you. And we will share with them some of our science stories so they really find how important science is for their everyday life and how exciting it is to really be having a career in science. And, and we can dispel the myth about some negativity that sometimes people think about science. So all of that we're doing. And our goal is we follow these students. There will be continuity. We follow them from middle school through high school. And then we bring them to the institute so they can have tours in the institute to different lab, and maybe some of them will spend some time in a lab. So I realize we're a small effort, you know, we're about 300 trainees and 30 investigators in one institution. But think about it if everybody did that in their own community, think about the impact of that and make resources available to teachers so that the teachers can really expose these kids to experimental approaches and information that otherwise they have no access to. So to me, that's the first step. That's the foundation. Because if, if you're exposed when you're young, you grow up so that you get receptive when you're in high school and in college to take science classes and feel excited about it. And then, of course, in, we have to make much harder effort in college admissions and in uh, graduate school admissions. Again, understanding that some students may not have had the rich experiences that other more privileged individuals may have received. So therefore, if we take these students into our graduate program, we need to set them up for success and we need to really define which areas they were not exposed to, prepare special mentorship in those areas so that they are, because my experience, they're just as smart, except experience, exposure, uh, what you've learned will set you up to be more better prepared. So I think we really have to follow that through the whole thread of education. So I hope this will inspire you to do something like that when you are a well-established scientist and mentor a young person in your community. Thank you, that's wonderful. The next question comes from James in Indiana, and he wants to find something out about Dr. Zogby's research. What inspired you to focus on molecular biology instead of other fields in biology, such as genetics or biotechnology? Thank you for your time today. So actually I do focus on genetics, but let me walk you through that. Um, I, I started my career as a physician I trained in pediatric neurology, child neurology, that's studying the brain disorders in children. And it was encountering children with devastating neurological problems that inspired me to go into the research. I quickly realized that as a child neurologist in the middle 80s, I could not do anything for my patients. It was really bad time. I could tell the family, we think your child has this kind of genetic disorder. We think it might happen again, one in four chance, one in two chance. But sadly, we don't know what causes it, and we don't know how to advise you to prevent it, to treat it, anything like that. So that's after three years of neurology training, I decided I cannot do this all the time. And as much as I love patients to help my patients, I decided to go into research. And when I went into research, I decided I want to pursue identifying the genetic causes of these diseases that captured my attention. And really, I found most heart wrenching. One example is Rett syndrome, where girls are born healthy, lose their abilities, everything they learn by two years, and every part of the nervous system doesn't work properly. So that disease is very choreographed. I was convinced there must be a gene that causes that disease. So that's really why I went into research. You may use the word molecular. Molecular means it's a molecule. The molecule, of course, could be DNA. So I focus on finding the gene 
for diseases that I was fascinated by or really wanted to solve, Brett being one another, adult neurodegenerative being other, and since then many other neurodevelopmental and autism spectrum disorders. And finding the gene is the first step. You find the gene, now you can diagnose it better in the, in the individuals. The family finally know this was a genetic mutation and not something they did wrong. Parents live with guilt when they don't know what causes a disease. But when you explain to them this just happened, it's no one's fault, it's very comforting, and now they belong to a community. And then from there, we create animal models for these diseases. And I'm happy to share with you that for one of these diseases, where you have an extra copy of the gene that causes red syndrome, where we have the proof of concept data to move into clinical treatment and all the preparation for that is ongoing. So I use genetic to understand brain disorders, but of course there's cell biology and molecular biology and neurophysiology that we add to understand the disease more holistically. Thank you, that's fascinating. Uh, the next question comes from Rudraj in India. And this question is for DAPO. My question for the panelist is, how can we actually ensure the growth of women in areas or countries where women are not receiving opportunities or adequate opportunities yet? So that's another great question. Thank you for that question. And in some respects, I think in answering it, I will very much build on Huda's uh, response, which is, I think um, we have to look for ways in which we can inspire um, young women at a very, very young age. Um, and actually in, in Johnson & Johnson, we um, feel that a company that has global reach the way that we have, has a real opportunity to work with organizations like yourselves or local um, um, NGOs in, in, in countries all over the globe yeah, to look, look at ways in which we can, um, through outreach, work to kind of inspire young women in countries all over the globe. I think then, as Huda also said, I think it's about looking at ways in which we can support um, through the education system, um, young girls to continue their education through, and if they are showing an interest, if they're inspired, if they have an aptitude for the STEM subjects, how can we then also support them, maybe through sort of programs such as scholarships um, and other ways to help them into university? And then I think once they're in university, it's again, how do we also make sure that as a global scientific community, we continue to help them understand what the opportunities are for them as they graduate to come through and maybe to continue in terms of their scientific careers. And so I think it is very much about how organizations like myself and others who have that global reach to try and make sure that we're having that impact in geographies, in countries, whereby it, maybe it is harder for young women to um, advance in the, in, the, in the STEM profession. Thank you, Dapo. It's so exciting to hear about what you're doing with your colleagues in Johnson & Johnson around the world. Our next question comes from Annabella in South Carolina. She has a question for Heidi. And what you've seen so far, is it too early to conjecture that blockchain may in some way lead to more technological advancement through its use in the patent process, whereby it might be possible to streamline many of the market inefficiencies and transparency inherent in the patent system and provide a potential way to better protect, incentivize, and reward innovators? Yes, so I can give a short answer and a longer answer. Uh, the short answer is yes. Unfortunately, I think it is too early to conjecture on that. And um, there are people that work on blockchain full time that you know are happy to make conjectures, but that's not a specialty of mine. So rather than speculate on that, let me connect it to some broader issues that I, I feel a little more comfortable talking about. Um, there's a lot of controversy about how um, we should be incentivizing people to create new inventions. Obviously, as scientists, we kind of think of often that's a very intrinsic motivation to make discoveries. Um, science itself hasn't 
whole set of institutions about how we have priority in science and you know publication and all these kinds of things. But from a commercial perspective, in a lot of industries, the patent system is a very central way that firms try to um, develop a way of, of making profits from things that they come in and invent. Um, the patent system is something that's been incredibly controversial, and yet people really have not spent kind of the time I think that's needed to understand not just what are the problems. So people make a lot of complaints about problems, but like, why are those problems kind of not getting solved? And are there like very basic reforms that we could be doing that would make a real impact? And so I've been working lately with some law professors on just trying to make sort of an argument that there are some like very basic consensus views that basically no one disagrees with unless you're really trying to misuse the patent system in a way that we you know don't think you should be doing um, and trying to move the ball forward on those kinds of reforms. So one is exactly as Annabelle described ownership transparency. So it turns out that when a patent is assigned, you need to list who owns the patent, although not in a way that's linkable to any data set where you would actually be able to know whose patent it is. Um, but then if you sell the patent to someone else, there's no requirement that that transaction even be recorded. And so, you know, just putting in place some very basic system of when you pay your maintenance fees, which you need to pay in order to keep your patent active, can we require people to update who owns the patent to at least create some low cost way of tracking ownership in, in society. Um, another example, which is my favorite example, is uh, Janet Freelich and Lisa Lerner, who are two law professors, have highlighted the existence of something called prophetic examples in patents, which is basically the idea that you can have fake experiments in your patents that are not labeled as fake. And it turns out that if you look at how scientists cite uh, examples and patents, they don't distinguish between fake data and actual data. And so, you know, you can feel like it's fine to have illustrative examples and maybe we should allow that. But we were kind of working together to propose a very basic reform that um, hypothetical examples or fake experiments should be just labeled as being fake data. So it's amazing to me that these things that seem like very obviously improving the very basic underlying, you know, functions of the patent system about knowing who owns patents and disclosing accurate information on the patent system haven't been done. But I think starting with those kinds of very basic reforms and then moving on from there to kind of more complicated things um, is, is the way that I see kind of moving forward in that space. Really interesting. Thank you. The next question comes from Shi Yi in China, and this is for Huda. How do you balance your career and family? So um, I would say a big part, there's two to three answers to that question. First, I'm fortunate to have a partner that's supportive. So that meant if sometimes I had to go to the lab at night when I was a postdoctoral fellow, he was, after the kids went to sleep, he was able to support me then. But the key answer really is structure. When I had little kids, I had a very structured day. I knew exactly the hours I could be away from them and I made sure I'm back with them to read, feed, bathe at night, be with them, be present. I made sure when I'm present with them, I'm present in the moment. I wasn't distracted. Thankfully, when I was raising them, there were no iPhones or <laughs> gadgets that will be distracting. Um, so I think that that's really important. And when I was at work, I concentrated at work. I made it a priority if they ever needed me, if they one of them is sick, they are the priority. Work can be started the next day. I can repeat an experiment, but I have to really go attend to them. So I think really the key is to be present for your family when they need you, to have a structure, to be organized, to do things efficiently. I didn't cook things one small meal at a time. I prepared some things in batches and divided them. We learned that in science, you make reagents that last you a long time. I made food that lasted and froze a bunch of it, went to the grocery store. It was very quiet, so I go in and out in half an hour. And I got help for anything I did not need to do. I realized I want to be a scientist, and I want to be a mother and a wife. Therefore, any other help with the house or with the yard or what have you, I got help. I, I couldn't be everything. And even though when we started, we barely had money to do that, but it was important for me that I focus on my family career. So you could almost say my whole salary as a postdoc went to these, you know, to help in these areas. 
but that's really important, babysitting and so on while I'm at work, but that's really important because you're investing in the future, you're investing in your career. So um, I was there for them for anything important. I would not necessarily go to sport practices all the time, but I did go to the actual games. I did go to their, I didn't go to their piano lessons, but I went to their rehearsals, right? So I think you have to balance it. You have to be present for what's really important. And I, I'm happy to report both of them grew up to think that being professionals, a boy and a girl, is the right thing to do. So they both work. They both married professionals. And one of them is a physician, scientist, psychiatrist. The other one is in Texas Children's Hospital Administration. So I did not turn them off from a career in medicine or science. Thank you. That's wonderful. What a great family story. Here's a question from Sandy in Egypt. And this question is for Topo. When was the most challenging year you've lived in your science life and why? Thank you so much. I'm not sure I can just uh, choose one, actually. I mean, I think uh, in a long career, there have been many challenging years. But if I think about what led to the challenging times, I think quite often it was when, um, particularly in my, in, in my career, I spent a lot of time in supply chain and manufacturing, where a lot of that has been about sort of constructing and, and, and setting up new manufacturing facilities to produce our, our, our drugs, or has been about um, getting ready to launch maybe a new, a new product, which um, is perhaps quite technically challenging. It's the first time that we've, we've actually um, um, brought that technology through to um, large-scale manufacture. And in those times, quite often, you will hit technical challenges. So no matter how, how well you've planned it, no matter sort of how well you're, you're ready to get that manufacturing plant started or ready to make that first batch um, for launch, you may hit some technical challenges. And in those times, it really does require you to dig deep in terms of your, your technical knowledge, your technical know-how. It also requires you to really um, bring the right sort of cross-functional team together with the right disciplines in terms of the various um, scientific expertise um, around the table. And I always think it's times like that where you really see the power of collaboration and teamwork because quite often it's a problem that nobody's seen before and it needs all those scientific brains to come together to kind of work through that problem. And so whilst it's quite challenging in those times and sometimes you know, quite stressful because you're working against sort of tight deadlines, it's also really rewarding when you overcome that challenge and you're able to then start the plant or you're ready to now produce that batch um, for that product launch. And also, it's a great way to learn. I always find that I probably get my best learning when I'm really being challenged, I'm really being stretched, I'm put in a situation that I um, haven't experienced before. So, um, so yes, there have been many of those opportunities in my career, but I've, I've found that I've learned so much in each one of those situations. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, this next question comes from Aditya in California, and it is for Dawn. Dr. Wright, what brought you to work at Esri, and how do you find your work impacting the industry? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Aditya. That's a, a wonderful question, and I'm based here in California as well. So, so Esri, uh, as you may know, is a geographic information system software company and it is involved also in many, many different types of research projects that involve mapping of all aspects of the Earth's environment and also working in concert with conservation organizations and with a lot of governments. And I started the first part of my career as a college professor teaching those topics. So I was teaching a lot of my courses at Oregon State University using Esri software and getting my students involved uh, with projects that again, use the software, but also presented those projects 
at Esri's very, very large user conference, which is the biggest conference of its kind in the world. So for many years, my students and I uh, went to that conference. But we also, and this is similar to what uh, Dapo uh, was saying in her response earlier, there were some things about the, the software that were not quite uh, at serviceable uh, to, to those of us who were working uh, with ocean data. And we needed to have our uh, representations uh, in the software in three dimensions, not just on a flat map in two dimensions. And it, it was also very important for us to be able to work with time series, so to work with that fourth dimension of time. And so I did spend quite a bit of time writing to uh, Esri as a company, telling them about the needs uh, of our ocean mapping community uh, in the software. And I participated uh, every year in the conference, got involved with as many of the Esri staff as I could to, to try to work on this very difficult problem. Finally, there came a time in my career where I was ready to go on a sabbatical uh, and to, to leave and do some other projects for a year. But it was also a time when Esri was ready to think about having a, a chief scientist someone who could be a liaison between the academic community and their company, and to work with uh, academics to bring academics closer to, to Esri to help them improve their software. And lo and behold, I got a letter uh, from, from Esri asking me to take on this role of, of chief scientist. And I was told later that they did this in part because of the many letters uh, that I wrote, uh, essentially complaining <laughs> about their software. <laughs> Uh, but also because I had been part of their community for many years. I'd had my students, of course, involved. Some of my students went on to actually work for Esri ahead of me. And uh, it, it got to the, to the point where I had a wonderful opportunity to straddle academia and industry. I, made, I negotiated with my university to give me a two-year sabbatical instead of a one-year sabbatical to take on this role. Uh, of chief scientist uh, in Esri. It actually turned out to be so fantastic and uh, so wonderful, but also so all-consuming that I, I made the uh, fateful decision to give up my tenure at my university and to stay full-time uh, with Esri and to continue working with them on these, these many projects. And so, so that's how I came to Esri. It's been uh, 10 years now. But it's an interesting job because even though I'm in a software company, I am not a software developer. I don't work in sales or marketing. I continue on as a scientist and I continue on as an academic. Uh, my Part of my mission is to uh, publish papers and to do research with my colleagues uh, at Esri, but always in conjunction with academics or with researchers who are in other parts of industry or who are in conservation organizations or who are in the government and uh, the types of science that uh, I foster or work with uh, at Esri. It's not just ocean science, it's ecology, geology and geophysics, agricultural science, uh, weather and climate, uh, conservation biology, uh, pure computer science or what we call geographic information science. So it's a fascinating uh, job. And uh, as DAPA was sharing earlier, uh, there are some really thorny problems that have made it very, very challenging, but that's been part of the, of the joy of, of doing this type of work as well. Well, thank you for the, your answer. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, the next question is from GA in Korea, and this question is for Heidi. When I recall the documentary I watched about Marie Curie, my favorite scientist and my role model, this one quote always resonates in my mind. Nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. I interpreted such fear as all the ambiguity and conflict that the lack of knowledge of science brings us. As such, in your opinion, what fears do you think exist in our society due to this lack of knowledge of science? 
thought that was a beautiful question. And I think, you know, any of us could kind of go on a different direction and kind of something that resonates with us about that. Um, you know, the example that came to mind for me is um, public communication around the approval of new medical technologies. And so, you know, if you think about how the, you know, in the US it's the Food and Drug Administration, although most countries have, you know, their analogous agencies that provide the same kind of decisions about is this drug safe and effective and for which population and how do we think about appropriate labeling? How do we think about making changes in those decisions over time in response to new information, which is of course, you know, as new medical technologies get used, we get more information about their safety profiles. And lately we've been seeing, of course, a lot of controversies in that area around the COVID vaccines, but it's a very chronic issue. And we've been very lucky that public confidence in the Food and Drug Administration has generally been quite high, but that's not the same as high levels of public understanding about the reasons that they make the decisions that they do and how they think about risk trade-offs. And I think it's very natural that people are often very um, unwilling to think about putting like monetary values on life or to think about, you know, trade-offs of health with other risks. But those are trade-offs that we have to make every day when we do different kinds of regulations about everything from car safety to, you know, new medical diagnostic tests. And I think thinking of that as a set of investments that we need to make in public understanding and communication of decisions that are made is just an incredibly important part of the continued confidence that I think we have that need to invest in making sure that we continue to have in institutions like the Food and Drug Administration that really are very core to, um, you know, society having access to the kinds of medical technologies that can really save lives, but also just understanding that, you know, just because we may have, you know, problems arise later, that doesn't mean, need to mean that a, a, an error was made in kind of the real-time decisions that were made previously. Um, but again, you know, I, I know that there's lots of different ways of thinking about that question, but that's one that resonates with me. Thank you. It was a wonderful question and a wonderful answer. Our next question comes from Alice in Sweden, and this is for Huda. Firstly, in what areas have STEM seen increased gender equality and what areas still need more work? And secondly, how do we inspire more girls to join STEM fields? So in my experience, medicine has seen much better, and in general, within the areas of medicine, such as medical industry and so on, has seen better gender equality than, say, the basic research, the more fundamental areas, mathematics, engineering, and all these other fields. So I would say of all of these medicine, probably we see a lot more because we have almost half of the class is females, and that's what you should expect. And at the end, when they graduate, they continue to stay with the field, whereas in sciences, we lose some in engineering and other fields. So we do know that we have quite a bit of students entering school to get trained in basic science, for example. However, we lose them at, through the whole tenure process. We lose them to take the faculty positions and to stay on them to rise all the way to the top. And that's something, at least I can speak for the sciences, we have to work really hard on. And in my experience, one of the biggest factors that you know uh, we lose women is that not because they're not capable, they're highly capable, they're well-trained, they do phenomenal good job. But sometimes the lack of acknowledgement of that talent, sometimes the lack of uh, invitation to be part of a community leading to change and leading to advancement, they get disheartened and they say, this is not for me, I don't wanna fight this fight. So I really feel it's very important then when we have women in science, we remind them and appreciate them. We remind them of the great job they're doing. We acknowledge that, but at the same time, we show appreciation and let their voice be heard. Because I think for someone to stay in a the field, they wanna feel that they are heard, they wanna feel that they are contributing. So that's one area I can speak to. I'm not as informed in the area of mathematics if the same trends are happening or in the field of engineering, but at least I can speak to the scientists. We have a long way to go to retain women in science. It's getting better, but we have a long way to go. Could I, could I build on, on Huda's um, point? Because I think it's a really important one 
that you make in that I think uh, how do we not only attract women to the STEM subjects at a, at a graduate level, but then as they graduate, stay within the profession. And again, it's, it's something that we in J&J in terms of we have a, a program called Why STEM 2D, which is about women in science, technology, engineering, math, design and digital. Um, and w- what we're looking at is how do we look at you know, really inspiring young women? We talked about that at the beginning, or, or young girls. How do we then encourage them into the STEM and disciplines um, in terms of graduate school? And then how do we attract them into STEM professions? And then once they're there, to stay there. And I think, as you said, it's about appreciation, but I think also it's about them um, feeling that there's a community there. So one of the things that we really promote is creating mentoring circles to encourage women to come together to support each other in their careers. Other things for me are also about women having to uh, see positive role models. So seeing women in their fields who are successful, who are advancing their careers. And so, you know, I, I, I feel very privileged to be on this panel with um, my female colleagues here today. It's how we also kind of make sure that we're continuing to role model to, to sponsor, to mentor um, women as they sort of begin their professional careers and all the way through. And indeed, sometimes some women take some time out, maybe because they choose to um, um, look after a young family or because they have some other caring um, responsibilities. One of the other things that we look to do in Johnson & Johnson is also encourage women back maybe when they've had a career break. So we have a program called Reignite that is all about attracting women back into the STEM disciplines and the STEM profession after they've taken time out of the workplace. So I think we really do need to make sure that we're encouraging women right the way through their career journey. Could, could I add upon that as well? This is such an important question. Mm-hmm. And, and I would like to, uh, to say also in support of what Huda and, and Dapo have just said, that uh, I see it uh, coming from the standpoint of the earth sciences, where uh, it has really been a serious problem where we have not seen uh, women students, women faculty, uh, women leaders in uh, geology and geophysics, in uh, the oceanographic sciences, uh, in ecology. That trend is now changing And I think it's changing in part because of so many of these organizations where women are indeed helping each other. Uh, The the strength in that is is, uh, becoming a a real light. And in my other world of industry and information technology, uh, I think it's also becoming a trend now in terms of these uh, professional, at, at Esri we call them employee resource groups, where they come together to hold each other up, to mentor each other, to train each other. We have at Esri the Women's uh, Empowerment Career Advancement Network, We Can, which also works with uh, an external organization, Women in GIS, which stretches across all of our industry. So that is uh, it's a wonderful uh, trend, and it's so uh, encouraging, and it's so fantastic that young women are, are the leaders there uh, in, in the areas of, of science and informa- information technology uh, that, that I'm in. Thank you so much all for those fantastic answers. They're really illuminating for your different perspectives. Um, here's a question that follows up really well on what we've been talking about. It comes from Ayush in California. And I think this would be a good one for DAPO. How can I, as a boy, encourage girls to pursue STEM? What can I do to further support and encourage my female peers to step outside their comfort zones? Thank you. What a great question. So I think that one of the things that we talk about in in my company is around um, joining forces with groups like what I just talked about, Why STEM 2D, and if you're a, a, a male colleague, becoming an ally. And that's what I would say to you, to become an ally 
to your um, your, your female students or, or your, your female colleagues. Encourage them. Um, reinforce, you know, the fact that they are, you know, doing great work. Um, watch the, the fact that sometimes we all have something called, you know, an unconscious bias, which is kind of almost fueled by what we are here and we observe in our surroundings. Watch that you don't allow any unconscious bias um, lead you down the route of inadvertently, perhaps, um, you know, excluding your, your, your female uh, colleagues from you know, work that you're doing, projects that you're doing, being involved in terms of uh, scientific discussion. And just really ensure that you are creating um, a very inclusive environment that encourages everybody in, in your class or in, 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 in the teams that you're working in who has a voice or has an opinion, who, has, who wants to contribute. Create an inclusive environment to encourage them to do so. And if they have a different opinion to you that maybe is different to what you and the rest of the group might um, um, think, don't immediately dismiss it. Listen to it. Think about it, encourage, you know, explore it a little bit, because I, I truly believe that innovation comes when we bring together diverse viewpoints, when we don't always agree, when we have different opinions. That's the power of diversity. And I, that's what I would encourage you to create, an inclusive um, environment that encourages everybody in your, in your group to feel that they can contribute. Thank you. That's really inspiring with lots of wonderful practical possibilities for boys everywhere. That's wonderful. Um, our next question is for Dawn, and it comes from Michael in Texas. Dr. Wright, as a scientist, what were some of the obstacles you had, if any, in becoming a famous scientist as a woman in the field of software? Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. One of the things that's uh, been interesting in, in my, my journey is that I've, I've actually had two careers, I think. One is uh, as a scientist in the academic realm, and the other is indeed as a scientist uh, in a company that creates software. But I would not say that, that I'm a famous software developer. Uh, what is uh, common between those two worlds uh, is indeed uh, the science expertise. And what has been challenging uh, in, in both of those worlds also is indeed the, the lack uh, of diversity, uh, the lack of inclusion. Uh, oftentimes I have been uh, seen as an affirmative action hire which means that I was, uh, I'm, I'm in this academic program or I'm on this faculty uh, because of the need to hire uh, more women or more people of color. And then having to, to prove myself and to uh, sometimes feel as though I had to work 100%, 110%, 120% harder uh, in order to to get uh, the respect or the notoriety or or the trust, and that was particularly the case in uh, the first half of my career uh, in academia. It's actually much better now, uh, as I am working in, in in industry still as a scientist, but uh, the emphasis is on the meshing of that science uh, with with the software development and the application uh, of that software. In, in many of these uh, innovative areas. So that, I, th I think that has been uh, the primary uh, challenge because there, there are many challenges. All of us have had so many challenges. And I want to uh, link again to, to what Dapo had mentioned in her, her earlier response, because this issue of diversity is, is so important uh, for nothing else in that it increases the likelihood or the probability that the answer or the solution is in the room. So it's, it's feeling uh, welcomed to that room, to that boardroom, to that laboratory, so that you can contribute or increase that likelihood. And related to that is the inclusion factor, 
because that increases the likelihood or the probability that we get the answer or the solution out on the table. So there is that empowerment, uh, that trust that you are competent, that not only do we want you here, but we want to hear from you. And that is also related to uh, the relationships uh, in all of these realms in terms of the, it's the conduit through which we grow and, and develop uh, together. So I think it's very uh, related to Dapo's wonderful uh, answer about uh, include uh, boys, including girls, uh, basically all of us uh, working together. And to me, that is, that's the challenge of the age, isn't it? Uh, for, for all of us with our different backgrounds uh, to, to come together and to uh, trust each other, uh, to encourage and empower each other so that uh, we get a, again to these, these solutions. Thank you. Let me follow up with that wonderful question and answer with another question from, from Kiara in Virginia for Heidi. I'm wondering, do you feel pressured to reach a higher standard with your work because you're representing women in the STEM field? If so, how do you cope with that pressure? Um, great question, yes. Um, I, you know, in the last few years, there's been a lot of uh, news coverage of um, gender representation in the profession of economics and also in economic policy. And, you know, it's interesting. I don't know that the issues that our field has are any different from those in other fields of sciences, but because economics is a social science, I think maybe we're a little bit more willing to look at data on ourselves with kind of a, an eye towards examining these issues. And in general, I think there's been a lot of things that have come out of that that are very productive and, you know, just genuine empirical attempts to say, you know, does it look, if we look at how women and men are evaluated. Do we think that they're getting evaluated fairly in terms of when their ideas are reviewed in grant applications and when they're coming up for tenure and how their work gets cited? There's a, a great paper by an uh, assistant professor at um, Toronto trying to look at whether there's gender bias in citation of women's work versus men's work. You know, I guess there's sort of... Um, I guess I would separate that from, you know, external evaluations and whether women are, are held to different standards from what I think of at least as like a more first order issue, which is it's not just women, but I think on average women potentially more, more than men on average hold themselves to a higher standard in terms of like what I value for my work productivity. So, you know, I value trying to be a nice person that creates an inclusive environment for the people around me. And I have some male colleagues that do that and some female colleagues that do that. But on average, I think my, my female colleagues probably spend more of their time, you know, doing that. And that's not externally motivated in the sense that it's not rewarded, but it, or not rewarded in a direct sense, I mean, but it is something that I feel like you know, it's kind of the unpaid work that, you know, we all put into trying to create the type of environment for our students that we would have liked to have had when we were students. And so, you know, that kind of unpaid work is really an important part, I think, of holding ourselves to higher standards, because it takes time to do that. It takes time to try to put in the work on admissions to do a holistic review of applications rather than just doing a cursory look at people's GRE scores. And it takes time to put into mentoring postdocs and mentoring graduate students. Um, and so that time has to come out of somewhere. And especially when you're balancing, you know, work and family, that's, you know, it's a hard thing to do. But that kind of higher standard is something that feels very real to me, you know, and we can continue to empirically debate, you know, how important the external higher standards are as well. But I would just encourage people to think about both of those and ways that we can carve out kind of giving credit and sort of like um, carving out space for people that are doing a good job of making those investments in inclusive communities in a way that can really um, not have that just come out of the research time and doing less research. Thank you so much. I have a question from Faisal in Saudi Arabia. My question for the panel is, what is one message you would like to share for all the young women from around the world? Thank you. It's such a great one. I would actually like to have each one of you answer it. Um, and I will start with Huda. The message I'd like to share is that you can do whatever you would love to do. And today it's great opportunity to capitalize on all the advances in various fields to let yourself shine. I think you have to believe you're capable. And I came from very modest 
background with very experience, small experiences, and I was able to do what I wanted to do in science. I always believe if I could do it, any one of you can do it. Thank you, that's wonderful. Dapo, what do you think? What would you like to say to young women in the world? So I build on Huna's point and say that there is no, um, there's no ceiling that the opportunities truly are limitless and you should truly reach for the stars and you should um, feel that you are empowered to really tr change the trajectory of science um, and use all of your skills and your motivation to, to, to seek to do that. Thank you, wonderful. Heidi, what do you think? What would you say? Yes, I think one of the most important pieces of advice I could give is to not let yourself be hindered by a concern about whether you're smart enough or capable enough to achieve something. And you wanna remember that if you are passionate about wanting to do something and you're willing to put in the time to do it, um, you are going to be able to find mentors that help you navigate the way there. And it's just, I think a lot of students, like they're their kind of own worst enemy of just kind of like not being able to develop that confidence. Um, but I think the more that you can focus on, if you have found your passion and if you're willing to put in the time, um, identify mentors that will help you, help you get to where you wanna go. Thank you. And Dawn, what is your message to young women around the world? I think mine is, is uh, very similar to, to Heidi's in terms of following that passion. Because in the end, we want to have fun. Uh, for me, I was able to find something that I enjoyed and that uh, was fun and that uh, indeed made me feel empowered and uh, that I was passionate about because it's that passion that is going to carry you through uh, the difficult times. And so similar to my, all of my colleagues here is to, to reach for those stars, to, to dream big, uh, to, uh, to go for, for what, to have the confidence uh, to go for, for what really makes you happy and what is fun for you. And along the way, pay attention to what surprises you because you are going to surprise yourself in many wonderful ways. And uh, don't recoil from that surprise, keep going forward through it and get more surprises and, and more joy out of, out of what you're doing. Could I ask, could I add one more thing? Oh yeah. And building on all of those things, I would say, and when you achieve your, 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 your aspiration, make sure you then pay it forward. So you then, as a female scientist, become an immediate role model and make sure that you also then invest in trying to help the next generation achieve their ambitions also. So many great, inspiring insights and thoughts for everyone imagining a career in science and working to make the world a better place. Thank you so much to Dawn, Huda, Dapo, and Heidi for this amazing conversation. And um, thank you. I'm really looking forward to learning more about your amazing work going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.